All right, good afternoon. Welcome. I see some familiar faces in here. So today's presentation is going to be on several online platforms, and this is solely for our benefit as faculty, so for your benefit. So feel free, pull your laptops out, and if you haven't already started a profile on these platforms, uh, feel free to do so today. Not only feel free, I highly encourage it. If you already have a, a profile, now's a good time to kind of massage it, make it prettier. I actually volunteered to do this presentation because I needed that kick to you know, improve my profiles, to make them prettier, to polish them up, put more information in. I'd been procrastinating on that for so long that this is, was my punishment to myself to be up here and presenting to you folks. But it did force me to do some work on my profiles. But the other thing that I found out, which I was a little surprised at, maybe a little disappointed, maybe a little scared, but the CV is becoming a thing of the past, frankly. It's becoming merely a formality that people are going to go onto Google Scholar ResearchGate instead of looking at your CV. So we're in a transition period right now, but within the next three or four years, that's what people are going to look at. They're not even going to, if you're looking for a job or if you know somebody who wants to, you know, have a presence out there and maybe get recruited or what have you, that's what they're looking at. They're not even bothering to download your CV. So this is a little scary for me because I had been procrastinating for so long. But now, uh, hopefully, the, the, the uh, background that I've done on these profiles, on these online pr platforms, so that I could stop procrastinating, um, I'm hoping to share with you, and maybe you also have some um, insight into these. The first one we're going to look at is, well, actually, I'll show you some statistics, which you probably can't see, but the United States is at the very top of that ranking. So the United States, this is a um, journal and country rank. So no surprise to any of us the information comes from um, El Selvier, and it basically talks about all the journals that are out there that we publish in. It talks about uh, you can search by various different factors. This is a ranking. The United States has the most published articles, the most citations. You get all of that from these columns up here. Um, in the handout, there's some handouts floating around. I gave you all the links to all of this, but this is no surprise. The United States basically leads the other countries in publications. This is the, another website for ranking universities, and Kane University is up here. I went to the United States, and Kane's falls under some really, I don't even, can't even read that, but it's, it's quite low. But again, we're in a transition period. What they're looking at is faculty who have these profiles on ResearchGate, Google Scholar, et cetera. So this, this number, if everybody on campus got up on these profiles, on these platforms, uh, this number would definitely change. So again, the first one we're going to take a look at is ResearchGate. Over 100 million publications, 14 million researchers. This is information from their web page. I don't know, would this be embarrassing if I asked how many people here have a ResearchGate profile? All right, good. All right, I'm going to guess about 40% of us. This is really targeting faculty, research scholarly um, faculty. And again, this is new. This was only founded in 2008. Most of these websites were founded within the past 10 years. Uh, 
this is considered the, the largest, what they call social networking site, I guess it falls in the definition. But Nature and Times Higher Education have both come out with articles that have stated that ResearchGate is the number one website for researchers. Uh, it was, well, founded in 2008, in 2014, Bill Gates from Microsoft gave it quite a bit of juice, several multi multiple millions of dollars, and they moved from Boston to Berlin, Germany. I'm not sure why, but that must be an interesting story. One of the benefits to the researcher of being on ResearchGate is that your number of citations will typically increase. After you've posted your articles on ResearchGate, the number of citations doubles within the first three years of posting. And that's really important for us because that helps our H index. And we're going to talk about H index, which is, I think the science and technology folks have been dealing with H index a little bit longer than some of the rest of us. But it's coming. This is one of the things that that is being looked at very closely for researchers. The benefit to the university is that the accreditation agencies look at these websites to take a look at what the research output is. All right, so this is basically a summary of Kane University, which none of you can read. But basically, about 1,245 of us, let's see, right here, 1,245 of us are on ResearchGate, and our pictures are here. Um, you can view all of our pictures here, all of the different colleges, College of Education, Psychology, and this is across everybody, design, everybody. It talks about where we have some collaborations, so New Jersey Institute of Technology is one of the main collaborating universities with Kane also that Red University. Um, it talks about some of the recent articles that have come out of Kane, some information. This was scary. This box here talks about the university president, the address, the phone number. Guess who put that information in? That was a little scary. Usually university's provost office take over this so that they can control the information out there. Uh, but again, it's new. This is very new still. This shows that of the 1,245 of us that are on ResearchGate, we sort of fall in the lower ranking. This is kind of a ResearchGate H index, but there's several of us that are quite high in the ResearchGate rankings, and we're going to talk about some of those people here. I like when I first got on it, I was, they, um, they send you lots of notices. They give you some positive reinforcement. Isn't it great to be um, on ResearchGate? They tell you when um, your article was the most read article from your institution, probably for about three seconds. But they give you, you've met, you've met another milestone, et cetera. So it's kind of fun when you first start to sign up for ResearchGate. So here's the website. It's researchgate.net. And if we can go to this. There's actually a YouTube. Let's see if we can. I'm going to talk to you a bit about ResearchGate. OK, how about some sound? Tool for Mickey? And a number of reasons why I think it's an effective tool that you should consider using if you're a serious researcher. Oh, like now, the magic. first thing you want to do with ResearchGate is publish your articles. You want to disseminate your this research. This is a good you time want if you haven't out there and you want started your ResearchGate. You actually profile. click on this your face right or the icon that you use to profile. identify yourself, and then you add your articles. And it works okay. really good quite well, and it allows people right. to see your information. Next question for the technology staff. It's not showing up on the screen.
I hear Mickey's voice. That's on my screen. That's on the overhead screen. OK, it's basically, what's, what is? Escape. Oh, really? OK. We're getting there. Escape out. Ooh. All right. Um, this is a very this is a very short video. And again, if you have not started your ResearchGate profile, this is a perfect time to do it. I'm going to talk to you a bit about ResearchGate, which is a social networking tool for researchers, and a number of reasons why I think it's an effective tool that you should consider using if you're a serious researcher. Now, the first thing you want to do with ResearchGate is publish your articles. You want to disseminate your research. You want people to know it's out there, and you want people to read it. You actually click on your face or the icon that you've used to identify yourself, and then you add your articles. And it works really quite well, and it allows people to see your information comment on it, give you feedback, and to follow you. The second reason I think it's useful is this little search box here where you can actually search for researchers. So those researchers who do put themselves on ResearchGate are searchable. And if you've read an article that's particularly interesting or valuable, you can search that researcher up. You can start to follow the researcher if you'd like. You could also ask the researcher questions about their papers, and you could collaborate with them. You can find people in your area, people that you may never have known about, and start working with them. For me, I'm starting to use it actually to find experts in the field. There are so many people in my field, but you can start to look at the people that produce a lot of research and have an impact. So I think that's a great use for this tool as well. The other interesting feature is you can actually search for questions in areas that you're interested in and interact with researchers. And as I said, you can always ask them questions, but you can engage in a dialogue. And I've had a number of these, and they work quite well. And you do find interesting perspectives and interesting information that you may not have been aware of. Of course, you can always ask questions. So if I click on questions here, I can enter a simple question, and then it allows me to add some more details. I can target that question to a group of people if I'd like, or the larger community, and I can get some interesting answers. And I find that actually is a really valuable tool, particularly if you're stuck. You know those, does anyone know about information on something questions? They can be very useful. I can also use ResearchGate to maximize my digital identity or presence as a researcher. Now, once again, if I click on my face and then go to Info, I can list my skills and experience, the topics I'm interested in. And by the way, that allows information to be sent to me on those topics, my research experience, my education, and contact information. Now, there is a search feature here that allows me to search by, for publications. And I have a library database that I think is probably a little more thorough, although I might come up with some current publications that isn't in that library database. But more importantly, once I list my skills and topic areas and I select some followers, Publications are actually sent to me. So if I click on publications here, there's a list of articles that I may be interested in. And so it's nice to be fed articles and sent articles as well. 
The final feature which I find particularly interesting is citations. So again, if I click on my icon here and then click on contributions, I can look at the publications and the types that I have published, but there is a feature here called citations. And if I click on citations, I can see the articles. I can see who's cited my paper. I can click on see more. And then I can start to go through these and maybe find researchers that I might like to follow or collaborate with. So it allows you, I knew my papers were cite, cited, but I didn't know by how many people and by whom. That would be very hard information to find out normally. ResearchGate makes it easy. So those are some of the reasons why ResearchGate is a pretty powerful tool for researchers. One of the aspects about ResearchGate is that you load articles right on the uh, on ResearchGate, so others have access to those articles. Um, ResearchGate has a, a ResearchGate index. Okay, here we are, and it's a combination of a number of aspects: your publications, citations, who's following you on ResearchGate. So it, again, it's just constant positive reinforcement. The more involved you get in with ResearchGate. Um, I, I took Xiao, Xiao Yu, I took his ResearchGate uh, page, and, I, and just to give you an example of what a, uh, a really good page looks like, um, he's, he's got, looking for my, all right, you get a nice opportunity to put a photo there. He's got a nice paragraph about who he is. And what he does, he's affiliated with Kane University. Uh, we have his link here if you want to do a quick short to his uh, page. But you have a bunch of tabs along here as they showed in the YouTube video. Here's his contributions. And if you scroll down through that, it would be all of the articles. And it says here that there's, I think that number is 36 articles. And all of the articles that he's uh, that he's published, and that also gives others an opportunity to access those articles easily without going through the journals, which is one reason the journals are not so happy with ResearchGate. Uh, so, he, so this is his contributions, which would be his publications. This next tab is information on him, and he went to Yale University. Uh, things, categories he's interested in, all of his followers. And the next tab talks about scores. So this is the ResearchGate score, very, very high score, 26.43. And it takes into account his publications, his followers, his citations, et cetera. So congratulations. This is segueing with um, Zhao Bo Yu. This is his. Google Scholar website. So if we go back to ResearchGate, that's his ResearchGate website. This is his Google Scholar website. And the big difference between ResearchGate and Google Scholar is ResearchGate has the articles on it, but you have to load the articles. One of the nice things about Google Scholar is that it almost does it all for you. You get these messages, did you write this publication? You click on yes, and it loads it to your Google Scholar profile. Now, it doesn't load the article. It may lo load a link on how to get it, but Google, I think, didn't want to deal with all of the copyright issues. So it's links rather than the actual articles. But one of the nice things about Google Scholar is it, you, can, uh, you can get a lot more data out of Google Scholar. So as many, almost as many academics who are on ResearchGate are actually on Google Scholar too. The two sort of go together. So if you start your ResearchGate, or if you're massaging it right now, um, you want to also take a look at your Google Scholar profile. So here we have the number of citations by year for his articles, the number of articles. And you can sort by citations. You can sort by year. Again, this is Google Scholar 
moving away from ResearchGate. Google Scholar was actually launched in 2004. So you have two of these websites, 2008, 2004. I consider these still very new, and they're, they're growing. Again, the Google Scholar, you have uh, the ability to sort and get data. Uh, there's better search functions. While you can't access immediately on the Google Scholar, you do have some links to where they can be found. If I track the citations through Google Scholar, again, using the improved information and data analysis, if I do it just for Kane University, we have Dr. Jeffrey Tony, our provost here, listed at number two. He's actually our highest, uh, our researcher with the highest number of citations here at Kane University. Now here's his Google Scholar uh, profile here. We have a nice picture. We have citations. We have year. His H index is extremely high. If I could read that, it looks like about 26. Uh, and here are some his citations by year. His background is um, chemistry, but from the time that he started, he's had an extremely high rate every single year of citations. So that's about 120 right there. All right. I'm s again, I, I uh, volunteered to present sort of as punishment for letting my, my profiles, I was procrastinating on my profiles. So as I was going through Google Scholar, preparing it for presentation, I had some curious uh, results here. If I go back to uh, Dr. Tony's uh, Google Scholar page, there's these categories, higher education, fiction, science, human rights, pharmaceuticals. I was curious about fiction. I click on that, and it turns out, if I'm reading this correctly, and I may not be, but if I'm reading this correctly, of everybody on Google Scholar, Dr. Tony has more citations than anybody else in fiction, which was a mystery, pun intended, for me, because I didn't realize that he had an interest in fiction. So the next time I see him, I'm going to go on Google Scholar, take a look at his citations in those articles, and try to figure out. Now I have a, a question that I'm going to ask him when I see him next. All right, so in the presentation, There is a short, I'm going to go here, and it didn't, I need to es escape. There is a very short, again, a four minute YouTube on how to set up a Google Scholar profile. And then also on that page is a much longer, all the things you can do with Google Scholar. This quick video will walk you through how to set up your profile in Google Scholar. This is one of the many tools you can use to track and publicize your publications and their impact. First, open your web browser and visit scholar.google.com. If you're not already logged into your account, sign in. Click on My Citations at the top of the screen. Fill out the profile information, which includes name, affiliation, your UH email address, areas of interest, and homepage. For homepage, you may want to include the URL for your College of Nursing faculty directory page. Click Next Step. Google will automatically run a search for your name and show you articles that it thinks may have been authored by you. Click Add Article for any articles which you did write. Click Next Step. 
choose whether you would like Google to automatically update your list of articles based on their search algorithm, or if you'd like them to alert you to review and confirm updates. Click Go to My Profile. This is what your profile looks like so far. The original search by Google may not have found all your articles. Click on Add to find more or to add articles manually. The first option, Add Article Groups, will show you groups of articles that may have been written by you. These will likely be grouped by co-author or by a particular variation of your name. You can add entire groups by clicking the Add All buttons, or you can click on See All Articles and manually choose articles to add. If you click Add Articles on the left, it will list all the same articles, they just won't be grouped together in batches. You can check the boxes next to your articles, go through page by page, and click Add. There may be things you have written which are not showing up here. For those, click on Add Article Manually on the left, fill in the relevant information, and click Save. You can now track your citations and h-index, which are measures of your scholarly impact at the top right of the screen. Please note that these statistics will not include any articles that you have added manually. Don't forget to click on Change Photo and upload a headshot of yourself. So far, this profile is visible only to you. Preview the public version by clicking the link at the top of the screen. Once you're satisfied, click Make My Profile Public. Once it's public, click on Follow and then Create Alert to get notification emails when someone cites one of your articles. I hope this quick video on how to set up a Google Scholar profile has been helpful. A publicly available Google Scholar profile is one way to track the impact of your publications and make your work more discoverable by your colleagues. One of the aspects about Google Scholar and ResearchGate is that they, they have different, like the research, ResearchGate had an RG number, uh, Google Scholar uses the H number. They can, be, they can go up and they can go down drastically going in between the various profiles. The H index is used by Google Scholar and it's named after Jorge Hirsch, um, a physicist at um, U University of California, San Diego. Uh, there's a graph, it's basically an algorithm, it's a graph that goes up sort of in a straight line here and it looks at, I forget which is, citations and number of publications. So the H index is calculated looking at your number of publications and your citations. Um, one of the things that uh, Hirsch suggested that for physicists, just as a comparison, for physicists, an H index of about 12 might be typical for advancement to tenure associate professor at major research universities. A value of about 18 could mean a full professorship, and 15 to 20 could mean a fellowship in the American Physical Society. So Dr. Tony, if he was a physicist, would be right up uh, even uh, beyond the uh, fellowship in the American Physical Society. The highest H index, this was, I, I got a kick out of this, the highest H index, Sigmund Freud, so you can have an H index even if you're dead, 
Sigmund Freud, his interpretation of dreams was cited by over 55,000 people. We have a number of chemists, a number of medical professionals in the top 10 list. All right, so hopefully uh, you've started or have been motivated to start your Google Scholar and your ResearchGate profile. Something that's a little bit older and, and hopefully most of us have done, whether we were enthusiastic about it or not, but back in two and two, you started hearing whisperings of LinkedIn as a professional website, the professional version of Facebook. One of the one of the uh, one of my favorite LinkedIn sites is Tara Higgins. If you remember Tara, she used to work here in Union. She's now down at Ocean, but she teaches social media for the communications group. So she's really into her LinkedIn account. She has her education on the LinkedIn account, and she, um, let's see if I can go to hers. She has her education on LinkedIn, and one of the things she, she tracks, here we have Steve McCarthy, uh, mutual connections. She tracks her, her current, her constantly updating education. So, so Tara's been getting a lot of certifications online. She has content marketing, online marketing. She's uh, continually updating her knowledge on social media. She's uh, big in volunteering. She's the president of a group in Ocean Grove, uh, area chapter advisor for another group, active member of some other groups, and she's been endorsed by a number of people. But one of the things about uh, LinkedIn is that you can message people. So if you're looking for somebody, either a long lost friend from high school or another researcher, one of the first places I go is LinkedIn because there's the search functionality in LinkedIn. You can pretty much search for anybody. And as long as you sort of remember what they look like, if they've posted a photo, um, you're going to usually find the person that you're looking for. So that's one of the reasons I like uh, LinkedIn. Okay, but it is basically a professional version of Facebook. One of the things that um, I find is extremely useful is, is having your own professional website, and I say that tongue-in-cheek because, again, I need, need to continue to work on mine to keep it up to date, but you can do one very easily and for free, all of these things are for free, through Google um, Sites. And the way you access Google Sites is from your email at Kane. And on, if you do the drop down from here, the drop down, it usually shows up way down here. And once you get to that part, you can click create and create. I have a bunch of websites, but you can click create and create your own website. One of the nice things about the new Google Sites is that it has what we call new sites, and it totally walks you through creating your own website. So there's a nice little video there, and it helps you out. Uh, I think most of you have seen one of the best websites that I've seen, um, Chris Bolito. He's actually my hero for this Google Sites because his website is beautiful, and it's always up to date. Um, one of the aspects about this is if you do a Google search, ResearchGate's um, Google Scholar, these Google sites, they push that rate my professor way down off the page. So that's no longer showing up first when you do a search of many uh, researchers and academics. 
I moved into a new community about 10 years ago, and uh, my neighbor did a search on me, and he couldn't wait to tell me what rate my professor said. About a, about a semester later, his niece was in one of my classes, and I never heard another peep out of him <laughs> after that. All right, so my hero, Chris, he's got this really wonderful website. You can access it. it the Kane OCIS group will give you this really nice short um, link. I hope they still do that. I haven't asked them lately, but I got one. Instead of this really long link to your website, but you get to set up a whole bunch of information about yourself. And so the first page is a welcome page. And here we have Chris, picture of Chris teaching. The second page, he has it set up as current courses. And this is one of the reasons he's my hero. He's already got the spring 2018 course syllabi set up on his website. He has another tab he calls Resources for Ancient and Medieval History. He's got all of his public lectures and links. He's got another tab that talks about recent media, and he's got all those links. He's got some YouTube videos on his website. So it's a very, very professional way of representing yourself uh, to basically the rest of the world. So today we talked about four different online platforms, ResearchGate, Google Scholar. If you haven't gotten up on ResearchGate or Google Scholar and you are an active researcher, you really need to. These are actually some of the better ones. Um, Academiaeat.edu, I haven't touched that one, but my understanding is that it's not, it does, it's not to the caliber of these, even though they say, well, our our academics, our citations go up by 80% in five years if you get on academia.edu, but these are also the same people that are on ResearchGate and Google Scholar. So they're going up probably more because they're on ResearchGate and Google Scholar and academia.edu is just picking up on the, uh, the result of that. LinkedIn is a really good way of finding people, and again, it's kind of a uh, resume online. And then Google Sites, if you're really, really enthusiastic about having a very professional presence that you totally control, uh, Google Sites is a really good way of doing that. So that's basically my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions if I, if I can. And I'm also happy to volunteer if you'd like me to come in and talk to if you have a research group meeting or a, a department meeting. Um, I, I am very, very strongly enthusiastic is not the right word, but I've, after preparing for this presentation, I've strongly come to realize that as nice as our CVs are, it's going to be these online platforms that people are going to look at. You may not even get to the CV point with people. They're going on and they're searching you online, Google Scholar, ResearchGate, first and foremost. So is there, are there any questions? Well, that since these are all new, I thought I was going to find that it was going to be your science researchers that were all up on Google Scholar and ResearchGate. But now it's not. It's design. It's architecture. It's history. It's psychology. Uh, there's so many different areas. And while we don't have all the departments for Kane listed yet on ResearchGate, there's quite a few on there, and it's from all different areas. I was actually very impressed that one online platform can service the needs of, of many different backgrounds of researchers. 
And it's all about getting your work out there for people to see, improving your accessibility. It, if, if you've been publishing for quite a while, one of the things you might want to do is go up on Google Scholar because it pushes the articles for you. All you have to say is yes, no, whether I wrote that. And then it'll tell you how you are ranked or your age index or information like that compared to other researchers. So it's a very passive way of finding out how you um, so, sort of how you fit amongst your, your peers. And you can, I know the public universities, the private universities, larger and smaller. You can search by university. I, that's a good question. I'm going to go and see if I can search. There's other ways of breaking down universities by other, uh, other criteria. ResearchGate, the value of ResearchGate is being able to find articles. So ResearchGate itself, and I was wondering whether there might be some reason why they moved to Berlin, Germany, um, out of Boston, Massachusetts, because of that issue. Google Scholar has completely bypassed that issue by, by not loading any articles on their website. But ResearchGate does ask you when you're loading an article, is this article you know, is it okay to load this, for you to be loading this article, it's not infringing on any publication or journal that has asked you not to load the article for X number of years. But they ask you, it's an honor, it's an honor system thing. I don't know how the journals can fight it at this point with as many researchers and as many articles that are on ResearchGate already. There is, um, I understand there's a, a university in Russia that is loading everybody's articles. But it's, yeah, but the, if you actually download an article from that university, they put all sorts of nice little things on your computer. The intent is, I think, to figure out if you have any intellectual property on your computer that they might be interested in. So uh, most of this, the uh, browsers block you from even accessing that. Other questions? How many people here were on Google Scholar? Not as many. OK. Yeah, OK, good. Good, good. Question? How do you connect Google Scholar to? Oh, for Google Scholar? Google Sites, OK. Google Sites, you create it on Google Sites. And then if someone is here from OCIS who could update me whether you're still doing this wonderful function and giving us little short little URLs for Google Sites. Um, that's where I got mine. That's where Chris got his. So. Oh, help you set the whole site up? Yeah. Um, when you looked at it last week, did you try the new sites functionality with the, the video? I, I didn't go through the whole video. Oh. Oh. Well, that would be wonderful. Well, I know Chris, Chris Belito's done a lot of work on his, and he's done most of it, I'm, I would guess, by himself, by himself, because he's actually had that site going for five years or more. Um, so any other questions? None of this is difficult. You know what's difficult is actually finding that chunk of time to sit there and 
play with it, but none of it is difficult. And the easiest thing probably to do would be to find a colleague who already has a profile and sit with them because they can work you, walk you through it much faster than trying to figure it out yourself. But none of it is difficult, and it's so important now. It's so important because, again, the CV's not, you know, that's usually not public information. People are finding you through all these websites. So it's really important to have a very good presence and a very professional presence and a very thoroughly built presence. Um, Google Scholar is famous for actually letting you know about publications that you've forgotten about or that one of your co-authors actually took the article somewhere else and published and you never were notified of that. So you find out, you actually, if you sign up for Google Scholar, you'll actually find more articles typically than you even knew that you, you had. It's one of the nice aspects about Google Scholar. Other questions? Is this exposed to the international community? Uh, everyone has access to these sites. So this is definitely for the international community. And uh, you see on the, the rankings, the earlier slides that ranked countries and number of citations and number of journals. Um, you know, it, again, we're in a transition period. These, these platforms are getting bigger and bigger and more popular. And they started here in the United States and they're just spreading. They're just spreading to other countries. Other questions? All right, well thank you very much. My name again is Janine Black. I'm with the management department. And if there's anything I can do to help you, I'd love to sit with you and help you start your profiles as well. Thank you so much.